see that on the horizon? Yeah, it's not aliens. It's AI. And it's coming for your low code. <laughs> Hi there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 543 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Why, yes, I am talking about AI for low code this week. My guest is the one and only Joanna Pingle from MathWorks. And we're talking about the benefits of using artificial intelligence for low code, the best practices in this arena, what applications would be a good fit for AI for low code, and the super cool stuff MathWorks is doing in this space. Also this week, I investigate a new realm of AI exploration in medical applications. Can AI ask AI for a second opinion? <laughs> but before all of that, please welcome Joanna to Fish Fry. Hi, Joanna. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. I'm very excited to talk to you today about AI. Excellent. Okay, so let's talk about specifically the use of AI for low code. So first, Joanna, why should we consider using artificial intelligence for low code in the first place? What kind of benefits are we looking at here? So that's a great question, and I'm happy to bring it up because it really introduces the topic of low code in an easy to understand way. So I consider myself an image processing person first and foremost. So I learned about image processing before I learned about AI techniques, probably because AI techniques weren't mainstream then. But in a previous job, I was a visual inspection engineer, and I would interpret images and identify locations of defects in train wheels. And the idea being that if you can identify the problem, then you could alert maintenance before it was a problem, and then they could fix the defect. So now enter AI. And now, of course, if you think of image processing, you can think of the benefits of AI. I could do my work faster, maybe more accurate, maybe even solve previously unsolvable problems. And AI has been so wildly successful that the majority of engineers now are interested in learning what they could use as the benefits of AI for their work. So what does that mean to engineers? People are doing image processing, signal processing, maybe even text or other types of data like tabular data. And everyone is interested in applying AI. So now AI is everywhere. And more and more people want to take advantage of using AI. But then this also means that more and more people, I would consider myself a non-data scientist, who wants to explore how to implement AI techniques, but might not want to do all of the coding before they see the benefits of spending a lot of time coding and learning a new language. So that's where low code comes in. And it's really this nice blend between AI and low code. So low code arrived to solve this problem. So when engineers and scientists want to incorporate new techniques in their work, but they don't want to focus too much on the language, they rather would focus on the AI techniques and the results. So that's where I really see all of this coming together. The low code can be used for AI solutions, and the popularity is growing just because more and more people want access to the AI technology. That makes sense. Now, Joanna, when it comes to AI for low code, what do you think are the best practices to consider? I'll probably boil those down into two things to keep in mind. The first thing to keep in mind is that low code doesn't mean no code. And I like to be clear on that as well, because the benefits of low code sound great, but there will also be coding involved. So no code will be entirely point and click, but engineers still want to be able to interact with the code to one degree or another. The term no code really puts you in a box. So let me give you an example of that. One example of that would be code generation. So when you have a solution and you want to put it on hardware, for example, maybe an embedded device or a GPU. So this scenario, no code doesn't really make sense you have to generate code to be able to talk to the board. So a low-code solution could be a great place to start. For example, if you want to kind of explore how to efficiently generate code or maybe even automatically generate code. But ultimately, there will be code involved. So the first thing to consider is that no code or even low code might not always be a great fit or a great conversation to be having in certain scenarios. Some people like embedded engineers need code in order to do their job. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that low-code tools 
can be great for exploration, especially when starting out and not wanting to get kind of hampered down by the code. But low code also needs to be flexible enough so that you can get your job done. So let me give you an example of this as well. We had a customer who wanted to use deep learning techniques to solve a problem. And low code is a great solution here. You can work with many models, you can explore and train on data, and all of this can be done with point and click apps. However, then they wanted to also explore maybe traditional machine learning techniques as well, like KNNs or decision trees. Now the switch from deep learning to machine learning should be an option for all engineers. And it is in languages like MATLAB, but not all low codes have the flexibility to do this. So the second tip is when considering low code techniques, Make sure you understand the problem ahead of time enough so that the tool that you want to incorporate has all of those requirements. For example, being able to explore both machine learning and deep learning. Fantastic. Now, Joanna, what kind of applications would this be a good fit for? Personally, if you have data, you can benefit from a low-code solution. AI or even non-AI activities. Most data will need to be cleaned and pre-processed. Images, for example, my background would need to be cropped or contrast adjusted. Maybe you have to draw some bounding box around the object. And all of those lean towards a low code approach. An example of this is MathWorks worked with a company called Dress that used image processing techniques in a low code fashion to be able to automatically train their surveillance systems. So this was able to drastically speed up their data pre-processing time using MATLAB with point and click apps. That's an image processing example, but then there's also benefits of using this for signal data as well. These point and click applications are great for signals, maybe even more so, because when you look at an image, you can understand what needs to be done. You can kind of see what's going on just visually. With signals, sometimes that's not as clear. So looking at the signals, being able to analyze them with point and click tools, this could be a great application for using low code tools as well. So... Where do you think AI for low code is headed in the future, Joanna? We're already in a very exciting place for low code. So when engineers and scientists can concentrate on the problem rather than writing the code, low code can add a level of sophistication to people's work by freeing up engineers to do their best work and not focusing on the language. However, I briefly want to mention, especially when we're talking about the future, you have to mention large language models like ChatGPT. So we're still in early days, and I'll preface this with we don't know exactly how this technology continues to evolve, but this is most likely the future of AI in general and specifically for low code because large language models can really help engineers and scientists to assist in writing code. So I will preface once again that the technology is still evolving, but we're learning that with ChatGPT, we can use it kind of as an assistant that can free up engineers so that they can focus on the bigger problems and not get bogged down writing code. So of course, you need to do your due diligence when you're using these models and writing the code to make sure that it's accurate and robust. And that's what MATLAB and Simulink are focused on, is making sure that the tools that you're using are robust. This is software that has been tried and tested, and these are powerful solutions that engineers can use in areas like low code and other areas as well. So speaking of MATLAB and Simulink, what is MathWorks in particular doing in this realm? I would say MathWorks has been working on low code before it was popular. I feel like just recently the term low code has been exploding in popularity. But MathWorks has been in the low code game for years, if not decades, because MATLAB has always been about productivity and ease of use. So our goal is always to bring low code capabilities to people interested in applications like signal processing, image processing, even wireless and simulink for simulation as well. So I'm excited about the future of low-code and AI in general because MathWorks will continue to offer great tools for engineers that frees them up to do their best work. Fantastic. All right, Joanna, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. Now, I know you love power tools and you're a bit of a builder. So tell me about your most recent build you're working on. Oh, that's a great thing. Thank you for asking. I love, love power tools. It's my absolute favorite thing to do in my free time. I spend a lot of money on power tools as well. So this summer, we're going to be building a full new fence for our backyard and built all in cedar. And I'm very excited to see how that's going to turn out. Excellent. I love it. (laughs) 
Well, Joanna, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. So happy to be here. Thank you so much. Did you hear that a team of researchers at Manas University in Australia have designed a new co-training AI algorithm that is specifically for medical imaging? And this new AI algorithm can, in essence, mimic the process of seeking a second opinion? Okay, so the issue that this new AI research is looking to solve revolves around how AI is taught to interpret medical scans. So traditionally, radiologists and other medical professionals label or annotate medical scans by hand, highlighting specific areas of interest such as tumors and other lesions. These labels then provide guidance for training AI models. The problem is that this method relies on subjective interpretation of individuals. It can also be time consuming, prone to errors, and may involve long extended waiting periods for patients seeking treatments. So this team from the Menashe University Faculties of Engineering and IT set out to change this by creating a competition between two components of a dual view AI system. PH candidate Himashi Arius of the Faculty of Engineering, who is part of this research, explains it like this. One part of the AI system tries to mimic how radiologists read medical images by labeling them, while the other part of the system judges the quality of the AI-generated labeled scans by benchmarking them against the limited labeled scans provided by radiologists. Another issue in this field is that the availability of large-scale annotated medical image data sets is often quite limited, and it requires significant time, effort, and expertise to annotate and label so many images manually. But this new team from Menashe developed an algorithm that allows AI models to leverage the unique advantages of both labeled and unlabeled data and the ability to learn from each other's predictions to help improve overall accuracy. And the algorithm was quite successful. PhD candidate Hamashi says this about the results of this program. Our algorithm has produced groundbreaking results in semi-supervised learning, surpassing previous state-of-the-art methods. It demonstrates remarkable performance even with limited annotations, unlike algorithms that rely on large volumes of annotated data. This enables AI models to make more informed decisions, validate their initial assessments, and uncover more accurate diagnoses and treatment decisions. So, where is this research headed from here? Well, this team plans to focus next on expanding the application to work with different types of medical images and developing a dedicated end-to-end -end product that radiologists can use in their practices. So I guess the answer is yes, AI can ask AI for a second opinion. <laughs> so if you want even more information about this study out of Menashe University or information about AI for low code, I've included a slew of links on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, YouTube 
youtube.com slash ee journal folks it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos including our very popular chalk talk webcast series hosted by me also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of August 4th, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.